Hey, people. Howdy from uh, the rainy, stormy state of Georgia. Cheers. It is um, apropos, I guess I would say. Uh, it has been in Georgia a really uh, tumultuous kind of a week for reasons that we're going to get into tonight, obviously. But it is, uh, it was, it was roughly 90 this weekend and uh, over the past couple of days. And it just dropped about 30 degrees. So it is nice. I hope, uh, I hope you enjoy a little bit of uh, ambient noise with your bourbon talk. Uh, we got some really serious shit to talk about tonight, and I'm really glad that you're here, and I'm really glad that we're doing this. Um, things have shifted a little bit in the past couple of weeks, and I think if I was going to put my finger on why, I think that what we are seeing right now is um, a little bit of a reaction to uh, the Biden administration having a couple of what we would call political wins. Uh, I think the, the passage of the Relief Act and uh, the mobilization of the uh, vaccination project, not to mention a press conference that uh, I, I guess they were just waiting on him to short circuit I, 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 I don't know. I don't know what these things are supposed to be anymore. Uh, it, it feels like the Republican Party has completely lost the plot. Um, you know, we saw today, I can't remember which one of these assholes it was, but they, uh, in, in the midst of, uh, of a generational pandemic and uh, a, a spate of mass shootings, uh, he's pushing forward the, uh, I think he called it the Grinch Act, which was all about making sure that children's books aren't canceled, which, as we've talked about, isn't real. Uh, going back to the Seuss Foundation, which they, they can't stop. They cannot stop with uh, the Seuss shit, which is which makes sense. It's kind of their level. You know, it's kind of a, a, a perfect non scandal scandal for them. But I, I, I think the reaction that we have seen uh, over the past couple of weeks, and, and I'm sure that you've probably felt it start to uh, percolate and start to build and start to grow and really start to, to metastasize. Uh, and it's not only with the, uh, the disenfranchising uh, discrimination down here, but it's also with this new drumbeat. And if you, um, you saw what I had what shared, which was Tucker Carlson, of course, welcoming, uh, and, and by the way, he's in the middle of all of this because of course he is. I mean, he is vying to be the heir apparent to Trump and to take this country uh, even further into what we've, uh, we've dealt with, which we're going to talk about that in a minute. But um, having, having him on the air and Jesse Kelly saying, oh, because of what is happening with the left, and how far they are pushing and they're not playing by the rules, which it's so weird because they're like pointing out Hunter Biden. They're so obsessed with this thing with Hunter Biden. Um, Jesse Kelly said, you know, the right is going to elect a fascist in the next 10 years. And Tucker Carlson very, very quickly is like, yeah, no, that's right. Which tells me that these are obviously like talking points on the right, they obviously have started to talk about the fact that they are being pushed into fascism. Uh, they know this is where this is going. They are carrying on one anti-democratic project after another. This thing's growing. And we've been talking about this for a while. We've been warning about this for a while that this was not going to end in November or on January 20th or whenever you might have thought was the cutoff date. Uh, this wasn't about Trump. 
This was about something larger and more dangerous and uh, grosser, quite frankly. We uh, we are tiptoeing into it. And uh, I, I actually had somebody ask, um, let me find this. Peg asked me, what is the end goal of the Republican Party anyway? And I want to talk about what the end goal is and where this entire thing is going. What is happening in America right now is that the Republican consensus, which has more or less ruled in America since the beginning of America, is a white patriarchal supremacist uh, consensus. Uh, lately, it has been particularly conjoined with corporate interest, wealth interest. It is in favor of rolling back anything even approaching actual democracy. Nothing that is happening right now is entirely new. The newer parts of it are the media elements of it. You know, having a Fox News, having a right wing media ecosystem having these social media channels, having the ability to tailor for yourself a reality that fits your beliefs. That's what's new. In the past, you could choose what newspapers you read and what books you read, but now it's constant. And these conspiracy theories and the misinformation are so much more readily available. And on top of that, they are supercharged by social media companies that are looking to profit off of the radicalization of people. These are the new elements. But people are right when they point out that this is a refurbished Jim Crow. It absolutely is. And it's important to point out that America did not just land in this current moment. It's not an aberration. What we're actually watching right now in this moment is a defense, a revitalization of past proto-fascistic, fascistic, white supremacist, patriarchal means of oppression. They do not want people to vote. And this has been the case in America from the very beginning. The founding intentionally with the Constitution and the way that our government was put together, it was meant to be at the surface, the service of white, wealthy, landowning men. That was the entire purpose of how this entire structure has been set up. There's a reason why the Senate only like within the past century started, or maybe it might be give or take a couple years, started to actually become a directly elected body. It was originally supposed to be like the House of Lords versus the House of Commons. Our, our electoral system was about giving a vested minority a white, patriarchal, wealthy minority power over everyone else. In fact, the first major problem with this happened at the turn of the 19th century with the election of 1800. And this was, and many people now call it the, the, the revolution of 1800, uh, you know, the emergence of democracy. The idea that a lot of Americans can engage in a populist pursuit and they can start to frame the government based on what they want. It was supposed to be an aristocratic, oligarchical type system. That's important. And, and, and all of the stuff that we're talking about, and we're going to get into some stuff tonight because we're going to get into some history. We're going to get into some background. We're going to talk about why we are where we are. In order to do that, we have to have nuance. We have to understand that there were things that happened at the beginning of this country that were incredibly problematic and that the founders were not divinely inspired. In fact, they really hated the idea of divine inspiration or revelation or whatever we want to call it. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But we also need to talk about the fact that they created a system that was meant to hold people down because they thought that they knew better. There was the idea that there were an elite in this country, the wealthy white men who should control everything. It was for everybody's own good. The poor could be misled because they were stupid. Uh, you know, African-Americans, it didn't even matter because they weren't even people. 
right? Uh, women don't even bring them up at the Constitutional Convention. That, that, that's ridiculous. We see the remnants of that today. The Republican Party has, since the 1950s and 1960s, of course, when we have that shift based on desegregation and, uh, of course, the Southern strategy, the Republican Party wants to return us to a point where there is a white, patriarchal, wealthy, ruling class. And they would much, much rather have it under the veneer of politeness. They really enjoy this idea of colorblind politics, which, of course, was made popular with uh, Ronald Reagan and that whole group of assholes. The idea is that, oh, racism has been taken care of. Sexism has been taken care of. Everybody is on an even playing field. Don't even like talk about this stuff anymore. Go forward, go forward, go forward. Meanwhile, they are intentionally changing tax codes, laws, reforms, everything in order to go ahead and make the country more in the interest of wealthy white men. That's where they're trying to go right now. They would very, very much like to do this without making a giant spectacle out of it. They, they're they trying to do it quietly by sort of like sawing out the foundation from underneath this, uh, what we would say an ascendant class of people. These are uh, people of color and women, people who are not putting up with this shit anymore. People who are not going to continue playing by these old, racist, misogynistic bullshit rules. They, they're they sawing the, 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 the foundation out from underneath it. They would much rather do this in the cover of darkness. They would much rather do it in a state like Georgia, where they could pretend that this doesn't exist, right? That they're, they're just, they're trying to make elections safe and fair, right? But they are doing this on purpose. They are doing this to disarm democracy. And if they're not allowed to do it via surreptitious means, by sawing out that foundation, they'll do it however they can. And what we are being told right now, and this in part has to do with mass shootings, it has to do with open carry, it has to do with paramilitaries marching in the street. They are telling you we are either going to do this the easy way or we're going to do it the hard way. And we're willing to do it the hard way. They are telling you on a daily basis now, in so many words, and the Tucker Carlson thing, I think it's a really important moment. I think this is a line in the sand. We've been telling you, by the way, We've been telling you for years, those of us who pay attention to this, we've been telling you, these people are fascist. They have fascistic leanings. They have fascistic principles. They have a fascistic worldview. And everyone's like, come on, quit saying fucking fascist. Quit using that word. And of course, they're like, are you kidding me? We're not fascist. Come on. Stop saying fascist. That's really, really offensive that you keep saying fascist. They're saying it now. That is an escalation. It's a line in the sand. And they are being open and honest about this now. And here's the reason why. They're slipping. They're starting to lose that advantage. They're starting to lose that, uh, that, that ability to go ahead and stop this. Georgia, it's important to point out, is where this starts, because this was a ruby red, solid red state. And it's not anymore. It's, it, it, it's not even a battleground. For the past few elections, if there wasn't this gerrymandering, if there wasn't this disenfranchising, all of that, this would have gone blue earlier. It would have already happened. But they have to do it now because the writing is on the wall. I am in Georgia, and I have to tell you, everybody down here on the left is like, thank God Biden won. Thank God uh, Warnick and Ossoff won. Finally, we can start to stem the tide. But here's the problem. Here is the issue. They're not going to just give up. Now, it's, 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 it's panic time. It's time to start pulling out all the stops. They are coming out from the shadows because they can no longer operate there 
and still be able to protect themselves. We are at a moment of, of crisis. We are at a moment where we can go one way or we can go the other. This moment right now is going to be a moment that we're going to be looking back on for a very long time. And I keep saying this. Trump is not the disease. Trump was a symptom. Trump can either be the, the high watermark for modern neo-fascism in America, or it can be a harbinger of future neo-fascistic movements. This is a problem. This right now is going to be a major, major moment in where we go after this. And we need to understand that. And what happened with Tucker Carlson even coming out and saying it, what the Republicans are obviously doing on the border, they're talking about they have to protect these elections. We are moving up on a moment where they are absolutely unraveling objective reality and weaponizing reality and weaponizing nostalgia, nationalism, white supremacist paranoia, all of it. The thing that we heard today, and by the way, if you're interested in more on this, uh, this is going to be the main topic on, on tomorrow's, uh, well, it'll come out Tuesday, on the, the new Muckrake podcast. The thing with Lindsey Graham on Fox News saying, I need my, my AR-15 because in case the cops don't come after a natural disaster, I can defend myself from gangs. He's talking about murdering his own constituents. Think about that. He's actually talking about having to slaughter his own constituents. That is very, very old school American white supremacy. I, I, I tweeted this today. There's a long history in this country and our entire obsession with guns and particularly the right wing obsession with guns is all based in the fear of slave uprisings. It's all based in the idea that, oh, these people of color, like, you know, they, if you control them, they, they do good work. They do good work. But, you know, they, they're, they're very dangerous if you leave them on their own. You have to have guns. You have to be able to carry out your will using guns in order to abate that threat, in order to go ahead and assert your will on them. It's, it was in South Carolina after a slave uprising that the South Carolina legislature, prior to 1776, passed a law that said that all white men had to carry their guns loaded with them at all times in case there was a new slave revolt. This is, this is not a new thing, but it is a new iteration of it. The end goal of the Republican Party is somehow or another to protect capitalism, hypercapitalism, we should actually call it, is to protect hypercapitalism and white patriarchal supremacy. And they are going to do it at any cost. If that means killing people, they're willing to do that. The Rittenhauer thing, that, that was the beginnings of the stirrings of this. And and by the way, the the, the birth pangs of this, the, the the moment where I think a lot of us, our eyes sort of opened up and the, the hair on the back of our necks sort of stood up was when Trump obviously was telling his supporters to, to to rough up protesters, right? And you know, don't 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 be too careful putting their heads in the back of the cop car. Violence is coming. Violence is going to come unless we just give up. If we just give up and we allow them to construct this anti-democratic project, I have to tell you, it's going to look a lot like Russia. It's going to be a Putin-esque, anti-democratic, illiberal democracy. Which, by the way, if you look at it, is exactly like what they're trying to do, which is it still has the veneer of democracy. You still have elections, but then Putin wins, what, like 94, 95% of the vote. These are big questions. These are big, big questions. Now, to go along with this, Gangsta Dresky says, please address the Republicans at the border. I want to point this out. This photo op that the Republicans engaged in at the border, on our dime, by the way, that's great. Wonderful that, that we get to pay for this dumb shit. It meant nothing. They go down the border. 
They get dressed up like the big tough guys. They take a photo op, but it has nothing to do with anything. Republicans have no desire whatsoever to really close up the border. Do you know why? They love taking advantage of that labor. They love bringing people across the border and then paying them less than minimum wage or not having to give them benefits. They love that arrangement. It's really good for them. And isn't it weird that the same people who always talk tough about the border are always the people who are play, are paying for them, right? They're always the ones who are employing like these people that they're decrying. They have no interest whatsoever of actually taking care of any problem at the border. It's all symbolism. It's all militarism. And the entire point of what we're talking about, and, and I'll tell you, I've been doing a really... Um, the last few days of research for me have been really, really interesting on the new project. Uh, I've been looking <laughs> quite a bit in the 18th century and the founding of America and sort of what America was and how it was working. And it's really important to point out that the project of liberal democracy, and by the way, when we say liberal democracy, we do not mean liberals in on the left or Democrats. Liberal democracy is representative government having, uh, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, these sort of inalienable rights that we talk about. The entire purpose of the founding of America with a lot of these people, they were enlightenment people. They were interested in pushing forward the idea of what we would call cosmopolitanism or the idea that like we, we have different groups of people who come together and inform one another and they learn from one another and they treat each other well and they, they, they blend, right? This whole idea of nationalism, which right now is what's happening in this country, standing at the border and looking across the border and assessing the threat, right? And pretending like you're troops that is actually antithetical to the beginning of this country. The majority of the people who started this country were into nationalism. They saw it as a tool. They saw it as a, a necessary evil. They weren't into countries and borders and all of that. They started this country and they were like, okay, well, we're still in an era of nation states. But if we can figure out some sort of a system of exchange and commerce and trade and cosmopolitanism, Maybe we can get beyond the idea of nations. And there were definitely people in America who were very obsessed with the idea of America being a power, being a strong nation. Uh, and a lot of them got won over by that idea. But that is not at all what they intended. I 2021, standing on a border and looking at these people and vilifying them and pretend like basically live action role playing as a border guard. It's disgusting. And it's posturing what the Republicans are telling their supporters. And it's not just with this photo op, but it's every fucking ad that they make. They're out there with an AR-15 shooting targets, shooting legislation, doing all this stuff. They are telling their supporters over and over and over again, I will fight for you. Because they keep shoveling the same conspiracy bullshit to them, which is that the liberal traders and people of color and puppet masters, who most of the time are Jewish elders of, uh, protocols of the elders of Zion puppet masters, that they're coming for you and that they'll kill you. And they'll take your kids, drink their blood, do whatever. Which, by the way, is always what they do. And not just Republicans, by the way. This is centuries old. It's always what these people do. They tell the same stories. That's why this thing is so predictable. I am not a psychic. I, 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 I do my best to understand these things and learn from my research and stuff. But I can tell you that this story is the same damn story over and over again. And it only leads to a couple of places. We either dismantle this thing or... We're in for some trouble. I'm talking like genocidal level trouble. David Petraeus says, my question is really, why do the Democrats and liberals not see the fascism as a totalitarian ideology and oppose it? They think that Republicans are normal political party. I think a lot of people are in denial about it. And I'll tell you why they're in denial about it. 
And and you, by the way, I'm so glad that you're hanging out here tonight. I promise it's not all doom and gloom tonight. We got some uh, questions with hope. We've got some solutions. We've got some ideas. I want to say I'm happy that you're here. I'm happy that we're hanging out. Uh, I, I I'm so glad that we do this. But I want to point out we're talking about real shit here. This is disturbing. Like it truly is. It is a truly disturbing thing that we are talking about. It's frightening frightening. And in order to start engaging with it, in order to start actually wrapping your head around this idea about what's actually happening in this country and what we are actually facing, to actually start to reckon with that and wrestle with it and understand it, we have to wrestle with who we are and where we've been. That's not a fun thing. The Democratic Party, their message and their narrative for decades now, has been based around the idea of American exceptionalism. It really, it really has been. We have to start dealing with the defects in the system. We have to start dealing with the actual problems, the actual white supremacist patriarchal problems that are plaguing us. Democrats don't want to believe it. Democrats don't want to wrestle with it. On top of that, some of them don't want to look in the mirror and understand where their privilege comes from. A lot of them don't want to think about how they came to power, how they came to wealth, or how they came to, to fruition in their careers. But it's frightening. It really, really is frightening. Absolutely, the pandemic was a genocidal moment. There were crimes against humanity carried out. I read again today, uh, I don't know how I came across it, but that, uh, that expose that Kushner's relief plan was absolutely pushed aside because Democrats were dying of the pandemic more than Republicans. The fact that those people aren't on their way to jail, aren't being tried right now, it's really problematic. Really, really, really problematic. Bus driver Mike, here's my question. When do you think synchronized goose stepping begins? I don't think that we're going to see necessarily that. And, and this was something that it took me a while to sort of start wrapping my head around. I think most of us, when we think of fascism, of course, we go ahead and we think of Italian fascism or we think of German Nazism. And we kind of expect whatever thing after it is going to look like it. Right. We expect people to show up in red armbands or brown shirts. Right. And, and giving Nazi salutes. Some of them do. Some of them definitely, definitely live within that sort of uh, throwback nostalgic realm. American fascism is going to look like American fascism. It's going to look a lot like what we've been seeing, which is like, I'm sorry. The other day I, I tweeted about this, too. I saw this guy in a truck who had a bunch of stickers on the back of his car. It was like those ones where it's like the dad, the mom, and the kids. This one was like his guns. It was his gun inventory. Like it was obvious that it, they had been custom made to reflect like his particular guns. Gun culture. Uh, this this mercenary culture with, um, you know, the, uh, the skulls, the Punisher skulls, all of that stuff. People wearing mercenary outfits and mercenary fashion and, and sort of carrying themselves like that. Like people who are starting to make that their, their hobby, which is the idea of not just like, you know, bugging out on the weekend or whatever, but preparing for a battle with the United Nations. It's going to look like the, the madness that took place around, we're going to talk about ba Bannon here in a second. We got to talk about Bannon here in a second. It's going to look like the madness around the Iraq war for anyone who can remember that. It's going to look a lot like that. And that's what we're looking at right now. We're, we're in it. We're in it. They are, they are, and this is important. And this goes back to the Tucker Carlson segment with Jesse Kelly. They are they are rationalizing in plain sight. They are rationalizing in public, openly embracing fascism. We've seen this before in the 1990s, right before the Oklahoma City bombing. You had a bunch of people like Rush Limbaugh openly talking about revolution and civil war and killing other people. Matter of fact, God, what was it? It was uh, I'm trying to 
trying to think. It was in 2016, maybe in 2017. You had a lot of people who were like writing these columns and the columns were like, is it time for a second civil war? They're trying it on for size. They're talking about it. They're telling you what is happening at this moment. That's the frightening thing, is that we are in it, and they are reckoning with it. They are wrestling with it before our very eyes. All you have to do is turn on Tucker Carlson, and if you watch for long enough, you recognize that they are constructing this white supremacist fascistic project. They're not even hiding it anymore. It's right there out in the open. Okay, I got a couple together, and it goes along with this. Uh, all we are saying, is there any way to quell the far right's desire for violence? It feels like they're ramping up again on Facebook. Existential Haiku says, between Tucker suggesting fascism is an appropriate response to the radical left and Lindsey Graham fantasizing about murdering his constituents, it feels like the right are preparing for the people for an all-out war. What are we to do? It absolutely is a preparation for that. This is a situation where... We are watching them start to really chew on it a little bit. They're really starting to figure out, like, how does this taste? How does this look? It's like going, it's back in the old days when we used to be able to go to the store and, and try clothes on. That's what they're doing. They are preparing for violence. And by the way, like, I don't like saying this. I don't like talking about this. I don't like knowing this. I said on the muckrake podcast god i don't know it's been a couple months maybe a few months i said when the pandemic starts to come to a close and when we start returning to a semblance of normal life we're going to start seeing more of these shootings which we are and unfortunately, we're going to see a lot of people who are still pissed off about the election and, you know, are all hyped up on um, conspiracy theories and fascistic rhetoric and misinformation and, you know, radicalization from all kinds of different sources. I mean, we're going to see more January 6th like situations, whether or not it's the, the capital or the capital of states and state houses. It's it's going to it's going to go. So what I would say in terms of what we can do about it, we can recognize it's a problem and we can start to actually work against, we can work against the atomization of society, which is a problem that all of us can affect. All of us can start to reach out to other people and communicate with other people and start repairing some of the, 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 the gulfs in the human connection. We have been taught that we are each other's enemies and that we are each other's competitors. We can work on that. We can do a little bit of heavy lifting on that end. If we can do it safely and we can do it, um, you know, in our own time and take care of ourselves. But there's another part to it too. And, you know, there's a hard thing to all of this. What we're talking about here is the beginning of understanding and the beginning of action. We have to understand what's happening in order to start working against it, right? In order for us to start engaging in solidarity, in order for us to start fighting back against this, in order for us to start influencing politicians to hear us, to understand what's going on, and by the way, in order to make news media and journalists understand that this isn't something to fuck around with, we play a role in that too. We have been watching on TV. We have watched our politics get turned into spectacle. We have watched it get turned into uh, reality television. It is hard. It is really, really hard. We have to do our part to not play into those narratives, not play into the spectacle, not buy into the spectacle. We have to do our part to start repairing bridges of atomization. It's hard. But I have to tell you, immobilization isn't any better. Just feeling like there's nothing we could possibly do. We have to start preparing ourselves. We have to do better. I keep saying it's a three-step thing. We have to get educated. We have to get pissed off. And we have to get organized. That's the important thing. I'm trying really, really hard to... I'm trying really, really hard to get on here and, and educate. 
I'm trying really, really hard on here to try and let people know what's going on. I want people to take this and then go tell somebody else about it. Like, go tell people what is happening. Go tell, go explain to them what's going on. Because people just look around and I know that you know it. People talk about politics and they're like, man, things are just weird right now, aren't they? Yes, they are weird, but they're not inexplicable. They're not unexplainable. We can understand what's going on right now. And knowing what's going on is the first step in figuring out how to fix it. We have to go talk to people. We have to spread the word of this. It's not just enough for us to get on here and talk about this and diagnose it. We have to tell people. Sometimes you have to dumb it down. Absolutely you do. I mean, I, I try really, really hard to simplify the things. I think that's my talent is I'm able to like, I don't know, through research or whatever, I'm able to like it's get a get a glimpse of it. And then maybe I can start to 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 bring it into a vernacular that my people can get to. But we gotta we gotta work on this thing. We we really, really do. But if we feel like there's nothing we can do and that we are powerless, nothing's going to change. Nothing. And that's what they want. They want it to stay like this. They want us to feel powerless. They want us to feel alone. We have to start reaching out to people and say, hey, do you know what's going on? And then telling them what's going on and talking about it. And here is, and I keep saying this, this is the important thing. We have the truth on our side. What we're talking about right now is actually what's going on. It smacks of truth. It's the actual story about what's going on. It's none of this bullshit posturing. It's not Dr. Seuss or I thought I saw uh, Wells say in here that it's soy. So I, I don't, is that, is that even true? Is it actually soy? Is that actually how you pronounce Seuss? Anyway, you have to be able to go out there and talk to other people and say, hey, by the way, I think there's actually something happening that is actually going on. And, and, and real fast, this is important. This is super, super, super important, okay? The way that I put this is important. What we're talking about is what people talk about when, 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 they, when the door is shut. Like politicos and insiders, politicians, all these people. For the most part, they all know that this is actually what's going on. These conversations that we're, happen we're having right now. They believe in a thing, I don't know if y'all have ever heard of this, the allegory of the cave. They believe that the truth is too weird and strange and most people can't be exposed to it. They're too stupid. They don't understand it. And so they, they get out of the cave and they let everybody else worry about this show of politics, the spectacle of politics. What we're talking about is what I would term deep politics, is the actual story behind the story. The story that we watch on TV, the spectacle of like good guys versus bad guys and like, oh, who won this cycle? Who won that cycle? That's not actually what's going on. What's actually going on is this fight that we're talking about tonight. We're actually talking about deeper politics instead of this surface level TV show bullshit, which is what we have to talk to people about. People know it's phony. That's why they buy into conspiracy theories. Talk to them about the truth. Talk to them about what's going on. And if you talk to them about that, they can start to wake up. They can start to have actual conversations about this stuff. And those conspiracy theories lose power. If they can understand the actual story within the story, those other stories start to lose power. Donna said, you were tweeting about the founders not liking the evangelicals. Can you talk more about this and why things have gotten so confused with government and religion? Absolutely. The founders were mostly deists. And deists are people who believe that maybe the universe was created by um, a creator, but they left it alone. And, and, and there were no such things as miracles. They hated the idea of what's called revelatory knowledge. Revelatory knowledge is knowledge that, you know, God creates a burning bush and tells you a story, or he sends his only son to earth and, and he delivers the message of the gospel, right? The problem with, um, the problem with revelatory knowledge knowledge is anybody can claim that they have revelatory knowledge. God told me to do this. Well, shit, what do we do at that point? The founders and the people around the Enlightenment were deists who believed in reason and empirical evidence. They thought that people talking about revelatory language, particularly evangelicals, were dangerous people. Before the founding of this country, we had entire governments being taken over by religious conspiracy theory mobs. Maryland was taken over by a conspiracy theory mob. 
that believe that Catholics were engaged in this big giant conspiracy theory. They believed back in Europe, all of the wars and all of the civil wars and all of the oppression was caused by religion. They thought religion had been used to manipulate people. So most of the founders, most of America's founding fathers, this is fun. Most of them were secretly deists who didn't actually believe in religion as it was like defined. They thought evangelicals were really, really dangerous, but they also did not think that they were going to be able to create a country that didn't involve them or at least have the sheen of religion. But most of them didn't believe in this. There is a reason why there was a separation of church and state. They did not want religion to play a major role in American life. They hated the evangelicals. Hated. Them. That's a true story. I didn't know that. <sighs> This new book's blowing my mind, by the way, on a, on a regular basis. No more war. A few months removed from the Trump presidency. What do you think about him and it? I don't think about him very much. Uh, Donald Trump is going to go down in history as a very, very, very minor president who was more a symbol of America's decline. Uh, I'm, he, was a, he was a present danger every single day of his presidency. We've gotten out of it. We've lost a whole hell of a lot of Americans because of what he has done. Now it is time to realize that Donald Trump was a symptom, not the disease. Again, what I just said a while ago is that Trump can either be the high water mark of neo-fascism in America, modern America, or he can be the beginnings of a larger neo-fascistic movement. So we got to do something. We, we got to recognize and, and not worry about Trump. He's a distraction at all times. Look at what the Republican Party is now doing in the wake of Trump. They're still chasing Trump. They understand. And I kept telling people this and they wouldn't listen. They just thought it was about Trump. They looked at what Trump has done and they said, you know what? He was an absolute joke. But there's something in the way that he operated, some way in the way that he comparted himself in politics. We can retro engineer it, reverse engineer it, figure it out, and then become actual, uh, you know, leaders of the country using the means that Trump did for our own ends, which is what they're doing right now. So that's why I think about Trump now. Jackie Stewart, if Democrats try to reframe stories like Senator Warnick did, why ask us about the filibuster, ask them about voting rights? Would it bring any sanity to the news coverage out there? The TV news talk is intolerable. I stopped turning it on. Music or podcast are a better background for me. Absolutely. I, I, I think that TV news, for the most part, with a few notable exceptions, is really, really, really bad. Really bad. And it's not real. It is... Uh, it's palace intrigue. Who's in, who's out, who's winning the day. Um, I have to tell you, I've been pissed off at Meet the Press for years and years and years, and it just gets worse <laughs> every single week. It's so bad. Uh, yeah, the, the news media is a major problem in all of this. And I actually think there was a problem uh, during the Trump years. A lot of the media started to position itself as like a resistance to Trump. Like they were heroes who were like really like coming after Trump. And and a lot of that was branding and a lot of that was grifting, um, you know, and there were major outlets that would do that. And I actually think that that was a really, really <laughs> that wasn't a great thing. Because in, in a way, they, they actually were against Trump as an aberration of the system. They weren't really interested in finding truth or bettering the country because they actually make a ton of money off of things that hurt the country. They make money off of controversy and spectacle. That's where they make their money. Um, so, yeah, a big problem is the framing of it. I mean, what was it the other day? It was talking about how Ron DeSantis had won the pandemic. I mean, my God. How many people did he needlessly kill and maim in that entire situation? They treat all of it like it's a game. They treat all of it like it's just a big political game, but it's not. None of this is a game. Actual lives are being lost. Actual lives are being ruined. Like, this is an actual human situation. Lisa, what's your pick for best picture? Oh, yeah, movies. Um, I'll tell you, I just watched Minari. Minari was really really good. Minari, it uh, got a little a little dusty in the room. 
That is a really beautiful movie. Uh, the best movies that I've seen so far in the best picture category are Minari, Judas and the Black Messiah, which was actually a really good dramatic biopic. Sometimes those are not great. Sound of Metal was excellent. But I think the best movie that I've seen this year, um, absolutely amazing classic, uh, was Nomadland. Um, the next time I teach a screenwriting class, I think we're going to teach Nomadland. That's a great movie. That is a heartbreaking uh, criticism of modern America right there. Really, really good. XNRA. During the press conference, President Biden agreed Georgia law was Jim Crow 2021. However, felt the filibuster was needed as part of the legislative process. Can both be true but still exist? Seems impossible. This is one of those things that... Um, the Democratic Party oftentimes finds itself twisting itself into knots, trying to do whatever. It absolutely is a new Jim Crow. And the filibuster has been used to carry out white supremacist projects since there was a filibuster. Um, Democrats are really, really afraid of being seen as extremists. Really, really terrified of being seen as extremists. Uh, the filibuster is going to be one of those things where they're going to have to... I talked about this on the patron exclusive muckrake podcast uh, on friday if you're not on there go subscribe we we do good work i think some of our best episodes are actually on our, our on our patreon weekender editions but i was talking about this if they're going to go beyond um if they're going to go beyond the filibuster they're going to have to make a public um they're going to have to make a public appearance of trying to work with the Republicans. And then if it doesn't happen, they're going to be like, you know what? You forced our hand. We have to do this. The question is whether or not they'll do it. They have to do it. They have to do it. They have to move beyond the filibuster, which is just a handshake agreement. And again, has been a tool of white supremacy since it was found. Uh, they have to move beyond the filibuster and they have to do it to help people. Rich H. Rance, this goes along with it. If the argument is that Republicans lose when more people vote, then, they sh then shouldn't the Democrats break the filibuster and pass H.R. 1? Yeah, they should. They should. The problem, and this goes back to the beginning of this conversation, the problem is if the Democrats go ahead and go beyond the filibuster, particularly to go ahead and try and work against uh, disenfranchisement and filibustering, the Republicans are going to scream that they're trying to steal elections. And we are going to have a moment in this country of high tension <sighs> that will increase the possibility of violence that will increase the possibility of, of blood in the streets but we have to we have to understand that we have to understand that we cannot simply say you know what the republicans they want it more than us they uh they're carrying guns in the streets and they're talking about civil wars and stuff so we can't possibly do anything that doesn't work you have to do the right thing. You have to make sure that people of color and, and poor people are not being disenfranchised. You cannot continue to play this game of chicken with one hand tied behind your back. The Democrats have to do the right thing. Have to do the right thing. Hecatron. Hecatron, with the new election law signed in Georgia, is there a chance in hell that it ever goes blue in the next few cycles? Yeah. Yeah, there is. Uh, I was texting this to somebody. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and, and, yeah, I'll read that first. I was texting somebody about this earlier today. And this is really, really important to say. Um, people in Georgia and people in the South have been trying to disenfranchise people of color uh, since there have been people of color in America. People of color in America, particularly in the South, in places like Georgia, have worked really, really hard to assert their rights and to push back against disenfranchisement and uh, that, that terrible oppression. I put my money on them. They're, they're more talented. They are stronger than that. Um, it's been really inspiring to actually see what has happened over the past few years with these coalitions that have worked against oppression and disenfranchisement. I mean, I, you know, if you actually look through American history, the African-American community uh, in the South has been incredible at organizing. I mean, as, as soon as they were freed from bondage, they were just like that. They put together these incredible political uh uh, corporations and movements, and and they 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 did incredible. 
I would put my money on those coalitions coming out ahead. I really, really would. I, I, I think the people of Georgia see this for what it is. To go along with that, Ed Corneau, love the bourbon talks. Hey, thanks. Cheers. Glad you're here. I'm going to be drinking some Woodford Double Oak tonight. Almost bought a bottle of that this week. It's good stuff. Do you think the Georgia voting law backlash will be more than they thought? I do think so. And will lead to scaling back of these obscene laws. I truly, truly hope so. I think it will happen. Will boycotts work? Here is a problem. One of the things about boycotting the state of Georgia is that you're actually going to hurt a lot of people who have nothing to do with this, including people of color who depend on the businesses that, that would happen. Boycotts do work. I think it would have to be a focused boycott, particularly whether it's corporations who have been complicit in this or have helped move this along, individuals and their companies. It's a little bit of a dangerous thing to go ahead and just take your money full stop out of a state because there are uh, there are a lot of people here in the state of Georgia who rely on that business, who are that that would mean that they were getting hit on both sides of this thing, both in the actual bill, but also with that. Um, I would just pay attention to the organizers in the state of Georgia. And of course, the 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 the, you know, most well known and uh, uh, conspicuous one is uh, Stacey Abrams. Follow what she has to say. She she has it figured out in this state. She has done unbelievable work, and she represents a larger coalition of people who are killing it. So pay attention to what they have to say. Follow their lead. They are the experts on this thing, and give them your support. They have kicked so much ass in this whole thing. Okay, we got a few more. Alaric Diamant. My question is, what are your thoughts on so-called red-brownism when people who present themselves as part of the left start linking up and carrying water for people on the far right? Now, Red brownism is where supposed leftists start working alongside of the far right. We see this all over the place. Um, the problem is in moments of political chaos and great change, things get weird and lines start getting a little strange, right? Um, one of the problems is that we think of politics as being one straight line. Here's the left, here's the right, here's the center, that. But that's not how this whole thing works. So it's it's one of those things where in America, we're actually so far right that the right is just off the abyss into to fascism. And Democrats are actually like center right, center, and occasionally center left. Like the, the left in this country is just uh, almost non-existent. There are pockets, obviously. But it, it, it's a lot weirder than that. It, it isn't even a, necessarily a horseshoe. It's just sort of like weird Venn diagrams that you couldn't even imagine how they go around. Um, I think one of the reasons that this got asked was because, yeah, Glenn Greenwald, someone like that. One of the problems is that American politics is just absolutely inexplicable sometimes. Um, to be on one side of an issue or another, I have to tell you, I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hard to pin down politically. I've said this before. Uh, I'm not a member of the Democratic Party. Uh, I caucus with the Democratic Party because I'm not going to vote for Republicans. My God. Um, I'm hard to pin down, but it has also meant that the way the politics work, I mean, I, on on one weekend, I've been accused of, of, you know, taking George Soros's money. And on the next weekend, I've been accused of being a Russian plant. It's weird. It's 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 a weird, constantly moving thing. But Glenn Greenwald is problematic. I, I don't know how to tell you this. Glenn Greenwald is such he's such a, an advocate and he's so focused on the idea of, of freedom of expression that he has actually started to like caucus with white supremacists who are afraid of cancel culture, which is about people being hurt by, by public pressures or expectations of, of, of seeing the world in a certain way. That's a problem. That's really, really weird, dangerous things. And the more that I talk to people who have known and worked alongside Glenn Greenwald, this is not unexpected. This is not something that they are shocked by. Greenwald has problems. 
uh, Greenwald uh, has has really held some weird lines. And just because on one moment when he was calling out the NSA and he was calling on surveillance and the uh, suppression of speech, that doesn't mean that he's your ally. And this is, by the way, like somebody like James Comey. Everyone for a while was like, I don't know really where to pin down Comey. It's like, you don't have to pin down Comey. Comey is not a hero simply because he stood up to Donald Trump. Like, Comey was a deeply problematic person. Um, you know, it was sort of the same thing with, like, Robert Mueller. Like, Robert Mueller was never going to be a messiah. And and we, we do because it goes back to that society of the spectacle that I was talking about earlier. We, we believe it's, it's like professional wrestling. You're either a face or a heel. You're, you're a good one or you're a bad one. We have to stop looking at it like that. Like just because one moment somebody criticizes something that you don't like doesn't mean they're now on your side. They're not messiahs. They're not saviors. It was like when Trump went after um, John Bolton. It's like that doesn't mean that Trump is a hero all of a sudden. It doesn't mean that Bolton is a hero for going after Trump. It's it's so, it's, yeah. Uh, Joe Manchin should be a Republican. There are a lot of Democrats who should be Republicans. Um, I said this a while back, like Pete Buttigieg in a great world would be a Republican that we'd be talking to. Like that would be a much better political system if we if if across the aisle was Pete Buttigieg and we could have arguments about whether or not we need to redistribute wealth or whether or not you can sort of means test things on the side and make a better society with tax cuts and little changes here and there. That would be fantastic if he could be on the other side of the aisle. But Joe Manchin would be a solid Republican in an America that made sense. But it's not. Yeah, the Lincoln Project made millions of dollars because they cashed in on this good guy, bad guy dynamic. That's why that's why Buttigieg can go on Fox News and eat their lunch is because he's what they have claimed to be. That's the whole thing. Pete Buttigieg goes on there and speaks their language because he actually holds the principles that they have espoused for so long, but they haven't actually believed. It could be so much better. Juxtapose GOP says, if you're forced into exile via time travel, which era would you choose to live in? Assume you can take a lifetime supply of bourbon with you. <clears throat> I have to tell you, um, I would love to go back and live through um, the late 50s, 1960s, 1970s. I think that would be an absolutely fascinating political period to watch. I would love to be a part of some of those movements. I would love to feel the energy of living in an America that where it felt like um, where it felt like revolution was possible. I had this really good professor back in undergrad, and he uh, is in '60s and counterculture class, and he was always talking about it felt like revolution was just on the cusp of happening. Um, yeah, I would love to go back and experience that, and not only experience it, but I think we all know that the mythology of the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, makes it hard to sort of understand what actually occurred. The more that I've done research, the more that I've, I've realized that the story of the 60s and 70s is incredibly misleading uh, and, and, and what actually took place and how it occurred and what particularly happened at the end of what I would call the people's movements of the 60s and 70s, where actually I think that, uh, I think that white liberals let down a lot of people let down women, let down people of color, let down LGBTQ Americans, and actually just went away and engaged in consumerism in the pursuit of power. Um, to watch all of that take place, to feel uh, that moment, uh, to live within that sort of uh, maelstrom, I think would be really, really interesting. I think it would be uh, uh, fascinating. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think you're exactly right. The idea of being able to travel is very travel through time and live in a different time is very much a matter of white privilege. I, I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, and actually, I, I would kind of if I had a choice. I would kind of want to see where we're going. I, this sounds weird, but there's a part of me that is really sad that I won't be able to see what happens like a hundred years from now. Uh, a part of me that feels sort of like held back from seeing what 
this moment not only will look like in the future, but what like the seeds of this moment will turn into in the future. Um, I, I really want to know that. I really, really want to know that. I, I particularly as I'm studying history and I'm learning about it for the next project, that thing that happens here and turns into this over here is endlessly fascinating. And I want to believe that what we are building right now is momentum towards something. I, I want to know what this right now is turning into because right now, um, and we're getting ready to get to an hour and I have more to say about this. Um, yeah, so let's get to an hour and then I'll finish that because uh, I think that's an important thought. All right, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. I'm glad we're doing this. Two and one. Cheers. So what I was going to say, I think that we, unfortunately, spend a lot of time in this current moment feeling very, um, very trapped in the moment. I was texting with somebody earlier today or DMing, I guess we were texting or DMing. And me and him were talking about um, that sort of feeling of immobilization, the idea that you are trapped in the moment and nothing could possibly ever change. And by the way, that's a story that we're told constantly. I keep laughing. I've been watching the NCAA tournament. Uh, and it's just the same commercials. And it's like, there's this one bullshit commercial where they, they do the, uh, I believe it's rock and roll number two, na 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 na, hey hey, or kiss him goodbye. Is that the actual name of the na 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 na, hey hey song? Is it kiss him goodbye? Somebody help me out on that. But the na 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 na, hey, hey that whole song, and it's like, it's because GMC created a new step up tailgate, and it's like a revolution. It's the revolution of tailgates. And that's like the only thing you can do is you can buy new TVs and new trucks. And that's the only type of change that you can actually have in, uh, in, in America and in the world now because our system is so constrictive. And hypercapitalism is so adaptive that it takes any sort of attack on it or any sort of challenger and sort of absorbs it and then redirects it and sells it to people. Oh, my brackets are terrible. My bracket was the worst I've had probably ever. But that's not true. And actually, I'm going to go ahead. Um, Crafty Ginger says, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up with this question and, and wrap up what I'm talking about. Kiss him goodbye. Yes. Uh, are you optimistic for the future of our nation? How can we as regular people hold on to that hope and help us shape our future efforts to build more diverse, inclusive country for all? Is there one small thing I can start with? Okay. So to go along with that and what I'm saying, people I don't think understand the moment that they're living in. And, you know, there are these moments where uh, people kind of look around. And, you know, I've been, I've been looking around at the... Um, the, the conversations that people are having in history, right? So like, for instance, right now I'm in the 18th century during the Enlightenment, and there's this thing called the Republic of Letters, where people are just mailing each other back and forth, all these intellectuals and historians and scientists. And they're like, hey, I think something's going on here. I think something is happening in the world and that this is a moment of uh, that is ripe for change. And there are these moments, and history keeps telling me this as I'm doing the research, there are moments where the moment that you're in runs out of gas. And I was trying to talk about this. Man, I can't remember. It was a few bourbon talks ago. Uh, it's the circle within the circle theory that I'm talking about, which is it feels like at the moment that life is still, with, you know, in the 1990s, what was it? Uh, Fukuyama called it um, the, the end of history, right? And all of a sudden it runs out of steam and then you got to create something new and there can be a crisis, there can be wars, there can be a great shift in philosophy and politics and economics. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we are in it. That's what I'm talking about tonight. When I'm sitting here talking about the danger of the right, when I'm sitting here talking about them embracing fascism and violence and anti-democratic action, I'm not just talking about what they're capable of doing. 
or what they're planning on doing. The reason that they're doing it is because change is possible. They're pushing against the possibility of change and reform. And the more there is a possibility of it, the more desperate that they become. We need to start looking at it through that lens. There's more of us than there are of them. There is more of a chance right now of us making these actual breakthroughs in terms of uh, representative politics, in terms of freedom, quality, uh, all of it. There is a really, really big chance that it can get better and that it that it will get better. And this goes back... Um, you know, Steve Bannon just got, I believe, thrown out of Italy. Uh, he had a uh, fascist camp that he had created there with a bunch of neo-fascists. Uh, they've been putting together these camps in Europe for a while. And, um, you know, they're, they're training people to be neo-fascist. They really are. They're, 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 they're training the next generation of neo-fascist operators. Uh, they, I, I've talked about it on here before. Nobody wants to talk about this, but there is an international growing coalition of neo-fascists who want to erase a liberal democracy. They want to do it because democracy is leading to reform and a shift in power. That's why they're taking the chances. That's why they're doing these things. That's why they are, they, that's why they are becoming violent and even more oppressive. They would love it if people just shut up and left them alone and let them control everything. There's a lot of hope. And what history has taught me is that when people feel like there's absolutely no possibility for change, it often means that we're right on the cusp of incredible change. Now, what else do we do? How do we take care of it? We get educated, we get organized, we get pissed off. That's the wrong order. We get educated, we get pissed off, we get organized. We got to understand what's going on. We got to understand what has occurred and we got to understand the actual story behind politics. We have to stop dealing with this spectacle. We have to stop dealing with this tertiary story, left versus right, red versus blue, all that bullshit, because that isn't even technically what's going on. We have to stop looking for messiahs and goats and all of that stuff, that those mythologies. We have to understand what it actually happened in history, as opposed to this mythological story that we are continually fed in order to make us subservient and allow people to continue to consolidate power and wealth. We have to understand how we actually arrived here, what's actually going on. When we understand that, we can talk to other people. When we talk to other people, this was something I saw, um, I think it was David Hume I came across today, the quote from Hume. And Hume was telling everybody, Change will happen when people are enlightened. Well, guess what? The story is not true. That sheen is not true. When we start moving beyond that, when we start to understand it, and by the way, like it's, it's not an absolute coincidence that things like the Freemasons and the Illuminati show up in the 18th century as people are starting to piece together the difference between the mythologies they've been taught and real world. Those secret societies and their induction ceremonies are all about telling people, oh no, you've believed a story for a while. Let's actually talk about power and, and, and wealth. That's what we're talking about here. Please provide a one paragraph summary regarding what is going on. Okay. Uh, a one paragraph summary. All right. America and the world economic system has been tilted intentionally to the uh, to <laughs> to the uh, beneficiary of wealthy and powerful people, particularly starting in the late 1970s, early 1980s, to the point where. Wealthy and powerful people have begun chipping away at democratic representative politics, which has led to a situation in which people feel alienated and powerless as transnational corporations have gained more power and control. That is one paragraph that I've written books about. And you can read those, I guess. The Republican Party is not actually a political 
party. They are a PR front for the wealthy, powerful, and white patriarchy. There's there's one sentence, I suppose. Cool. All right, everybody, let's finish this thing. Uh, I just want to say again, uh, really always, always appreciate that we do this and that uh, you all come and hang out. It is awesome. I really, really want you to tell people about this stuff. Um, you know, I, I get word out and it doesn't have to be about me. It doesn't have to be about urban talk or my books or podcast or any of that stuff. Tell people the truth about what's going on, because the longer that we continue with this whole spectacle, the, 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 the messiahs and the devils and, and, and all these shadows on the wall of the allegory of the cave, if we can get past that, if we can start having actual conversations about what's actually taking place, because I have to tell you, Ted Cruz and those assholes going to the border has nothing to do with anything happening at all. It has nothing to do with any of that at all. They're not going to take care of the border. They're not actually going to, you know, go after people at the border. Like that's all symbolism. It's just put on it's pro wrestling. Tell people what's happening. Tell people about deep politics. Tell people about what has actually occurred and how we've gotten here. Tell them about the history of how we've arrived here and what's actually at stake and what's actually taking place. Uh, if you're interested in more, obviously, there's the Muckrake Podcast every Tuesday. The Patreon, I really, really appreciate your support. I, um, we, we, we need it. Um, and you also get a free show, which I think is one of our best shows. That's patreon.com slash muckrake podcast. Uh, I opened a sub stack because of you find people and I'm really, really enjoying it. I am trying to educate through there because like I said, um, social media, uh, isn't the best place to actually talk about this stuff and go more in depth. Uh, so if you want to check that out, uh, that's Jared Yates, If you enjoy that, if you find information from that, pass it on to people, tell people what's actually happening. Cause again, it smacks of truth. It's actually what's occurring. I appreciate all of you so much. You keep me going. You give me hope. This community, this support, the kindness the, that you show me, but especially each other, uh, it keeps me going. I feel very hopeful. I feel very, very, very hopeful. It is a frightening time, but I feel hopeful. You should feel hopeful too. You are the best. Cheers. Here's to a good week. I will be back the week after next with Bourbon Talk. Come, hang out, bring somebody who hasn't come before. Let's do this thing. Let's get word out. Cheers. Salute. All right. Be safe, everyone.